This is the expedition through Exodus. We're going through each chapter of the book of Exodus and just seeing what we can see. Kind of just living in each book of the Bible. We made it all the way through Genesis. We've been in Exodus for a while. I think it's like the fifth or sixth one. And hopefully we'll make it all the way through the Bible again this way. Now, we made it up to chapter 28. And in chapter 28, Aaron and his sons minister in the priest's office. And you've also got directions about the priesthood. And today, every believer in the Lord Jesus Christ is a priest. He hath made us kings and priests. And we offer up spiritual sacrifices. And one day, we're going to get our priestly garments. Revelation 19.8 says... And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. So if you are a born-again believer, you have been made a priest. But back here in the Old Testament, the priests had to be of the tribe of Levi, specifically Aaron and his sons. And in Exodus 28, 9, it says, And thou shalt take two onyx stones, and grave on them the names of the children of Israel. Six of their names on one stone, and the other six names of the rest on the other stone, according to their birth. With the work of an engraver in stone, like the engravings of a signet, shalt thou engrave the two stones with the names of the children of Israel. Thou shalt make them to be set in ouches of gold. And thou shalt put the two stones upon the shoulders of the ephod for stones of memorial unto the children of Israel. And Aaron shall bear their names before the Lord upon his two shoulders for a memorial. So this reminds me of how the Lord Jesus Christ, our high priest, bears our name. Notice it said, upon his two shoulders. And Aaron shall bear their names before the Lord upon his two shoulders for a memorial. When the Lord Jesus Christ carried the cross on his shoulder, he had everyone's name on his mind. And he, he did it for each and every person, even the ones who rejected the payment. Remember that. Ezekiel, or Exodus 28, 34 through 35. A golden bell and a pomegranate. A golden bell and a pomegranate upon the hem of the robe round about. And it shall be upon Aaron to minister... And his sound shall be heard when he goeth in into the holy place before the Lord, and when he cometh out, that he die not. So they'd have to have these bells on them when they would go in to the holy place. And when they came out, and the golden bell served as like a sweet sound to God. But at the same time, if the people didn't hear the melody of the bells ringing anymore, they would know that the Lord had killed the high priest, and they would drag him out by a rope tied to his tied to his leg. And as a New Testament believer, you need to keep sounding out the word of the Lord so everyone still knows you're in the game. You know, if those bells started stopped ringing while he, when the priest went in there, they would think, "Well, God's killed him." And Exodus twenty-eight forty-two, and thou shalt make them linen breeches to cover their nakedness. From the loins even to the thighs they shall reach. So this verse shows that the thighs being uncovered actually shows off your nakedness. So the breeches covered the thighs. And it seems from the knees down is not considered nakedness. So you get to thinking about that. The That means the old school basketball shorts are immodest. So Allen Iverson actually dressed more modest than Larry Bird. You know, everybody would talk about how bad uh, Allen Iverson would dress, and uh, but he, uh, he was actually more modest. He w had more of his body covered up. But I've always thought it was weird seeing those guys run around the court in those short shorts. It's just it's just weird looking, and those are kind of coming back in style, and it looks funny. Also, something even more strange is what those WWE wrestlers wear. And that's just weird. But yeah, they uh, these breeches that the priests wore, they, it went from the loins even to the thighs to cover their nakedness. 
And you know, when the unclean spirit came out of the man in the Gospels, he put his clothes on. Before that, he was naked. So the feeling of wanting to show nakedness in public is inspired by unclean spirits. Now, chapter 29, you got the consecration of Aaron, his sons, and the offerings. In Exodus 29, 23 through 24, it says, And one loaf of bread, and one cake of old bread, and one wafer out of the basket of the unleavened bread that is before the Lord, and thou shalt put all in the hands of Aaron, and in the son hands of his sons, and shalt wave them for a wave offering before the Lord. So you've got these wave offerings. And this had to do with how the, the motion that they moved the offerings. They would wave the offering before the Lord to show it was an, an offering to him. And then you also had heave offerings to where they would, you know, heave it, heave it up. And you think about this, you got a wave offering that you're waving back and forth. You got a heave offering that, you know, you're, you're kind of waving up and down. What, what shape does that make? It makes the shape of a cross. So there you got the picture of a cross again. You see, everything that they did was a picture of something. Now, chapter 30, it talks about the altar of incense and the brazen laver. So in that tabernacle, the Lord made them put a brazen laver, a bronze laver in there. Some people call it a bronze basin. And this had to be in there for the priests to wash their hands and feet in. In Exodus 30, 17 through 21, it says, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Thou shalt also make a laver of brass, and his foot also of brass, to wash withal. And thou shalt put it between the tabernacle of the congregation and the altar, and thou shalt put water therein. For Aaron and his sons shall wash their hands and their feet thereat. When they go into the tabernacle of the congregation, they shall wash with water, that they die not. Or when they come near to the altar to minister, to burn, to burn offering made by fire unto the Lord. So shall they wash their hands and their feet, that they die not. And it shall be a statute forever to them, even to him and to his seed throughout their generations. So you can already see the picture, most likely. Your body's the temple of the Holy Ghost. You are the tabernacle that God dwells in today. And you need to keep clean hands and clean feet. You need to keep your spiritual walk where it needs to be. They had to wash their hands and wash their feet that they die not. You need to wash your hands and keep them clean and wash your feet and keep those clean. In Psalm 24, 4, it says, He that hath clean hands and a pure heart, who hath not lifted up his soul into vanity, nor sworn deceitfully. So you need clean hands. Are your hands clean? In Job 17, 9, it says, The righteous also shall hold on his way, and he that hath clean hands shall be stronger and stronger. In Romans 10, 15, it talks about the feet. It says, And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, How beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. If you're going around, your walk has to do with serving God, preaching the gospel of peace, you've got clean feet. And one of these days, your feet will automatically stay clean. And it won't be possible to get them dirty in your glorified body, even when Satan is bruised under your feet at the second coming. And Romans 16, 20, it says, And the God of peace shall bruise Satan under your feet shortly. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. So until the rapture, make sure you got your feet in the right place and ready for any battle coming your way. Ephesians 6.15 says, And your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. So stay away from the road that wicked men go down. It says in Proverbs 1.15, My son, walk not thou in the way with them. Refrain, refrain thy foot from their path. So... Aaron and his sons, they had to have clean hands and they had to have clean feet when they went in there. You, as a born-again believer, need to keep your walk in check. Make sure that you're refraining your foot from evil. Make sure that you got clean hands. Make sure that you got clean feet. 
Now in chapter 31, you got the tabernacle and the workmen of the tabernacle. One of them is Bezalel. And you've also got it talking about the Sabbath being made a sign between God and Israel. In Exodus 31, 2 through 5, it says, See, I have called by name Bezalel, the son of Uri, the son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah, and I have filled him with the Spirit of God in wisdom and in understanding and in knowledge and in all manner of workmanship to devise cunning works, to work in gold and in silver and in brass, and in cutting of stones to set them, and in carving of timber to work all, in all manner of workmanship. So this guy Bezalel is an amazing character. Uh, he's going to be, he can do all this creative stuff. He knows he's got the skill, the wisdom and knowledge and uh, understanding of knowing how to build. Uh, and many times you see people in this world and they can do amazing things like creating these, these huge buildings or these huge machines that, that, you, that you see in every factory. And at work, I look at all these machines as I go through the plant, and I, I can barely run them or fix them. So I can't imagine how somebody had enough knowledge to even actually make that stuff. I just, I can't comprehend it. And how much more the human body or the universe, imagine the wisdom, knowledge, and understanding it took for God to make that. But what this chapter shows me is that God has to give you all that knowledge to be able to do that stuff. Because it says, And I have filled him with the Spirit of God in wisdom and in understanding and in knowledge and in all manner of workmanship to devise cunning works, to work in gold and in silver and in brass and in cutting of stones to set them and in carving of timber to work in all manner of workmanship. It was God that, that filled him with all this stuff. So what this chapter shows me is that God has to give you the knowledge to be able to do what you do. Or he has to allow the devil to give you knowledge to be able to do what it is you're doing. Some people are so smart that it doesn't even make sense to your mind. Like those guys building that stuff in CERN. Somebody gave them some knowledge, and it probably wasn't the Lord, but the Lord allowed something or someone to give it to them. Like those people at NASA who are trying to go up above the heights of the clouds and get up really high. Somebody gave them all that knowledge. And the devil will use your smarts for his gain, and the Lord can use your smarts and give you more. Bezalel could have used his knowledge to make graven images, but he chose the work of the Lord. You've most likely got something about you that's that's impressive that you, that you can do that a lot of people can't. And you can use that for the Lord or you can use that for the devil. Either one of them will use you. In Exodus 31, 12, it says, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak thou also unto the children of Israel, saying, Verily my Sabbaths you shall keep. For it is a sign between me and you throughout your generations that you may know that I am the Lord that doth sanctify you you shall keep the sabbath therefore for it is holy unto you everyone that defileth it shall surely be put to death for whosoever doeth any work therein that soul shall be cut off from among his people six days may work be done but in the seventh is the sabbath of rest holy to the lord whosoever doeth any work on the sabbath day he shall surely be put to death. Wherefore, the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath to observe the Sabbath throughout their generations for a perpetual covenant. It is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. And he gave unto Moses, when he made an end of communing with him upon Mount Sinai, two tables of testimony, tables of stone written with the finger of God. So notice the Sabbath is said to be a sign in verse 17. And it also said that it's for the children of Israel in verse 17. Now this isn't for the church today. 1 Corinthians 1.22 says it's the Jews that the Jews require a sign. When God deals with Israel, he uses signs. One of them is the Sabbath. 
Me and you do not have to keep the Sabbath. In Colossians 2.16 this is Paul talking, and he says, Let no man therefore judge you in meat, or in drink, or in respect of an holy day, or of the new moon, or of the Sabbath days. Don't let none of these people make you feel bad for not going along with their uh, law-keeping. You know, they'll say, uh, they'll come to you and say, uh, You're not going to church on, on Saturday, so you're breaking the Sabbath. Well, we're not required to keep the Sabbath. Paul said, let no man judge you in those things. And in Romans 14, 5 and 6, it says, One man esteemeth one day above another. Another esteemeth every day alike. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. He that regardeth the day regardeth it unto the Lord. And he that regardeth not the day to the Lord he doth not regard it. He that eateth, eateth to the Lord. For he giveth God thanks. And he that eateth not, to the Lord he eateth not, and giveth God thanks. So you see, let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. And the Sabbath, if you're saying that you got to keep the Sabbath, and mostly today the people that believe you keep the Sabbath, they believe that, you know, it's just going to church on Saturday instead of Sunday. But that's not keeping the Sabbath even if we were supposed to. But Paul made it clear. He said, don't let no man judge you and that type of thing. You know, he said, let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind about certain days. You know, Sunday is not any more of an important day than Tuesday. You should be doing right and uh, thinking about God just as much on Tuesday as you did on Sunday. And... A lot of times people just see Sunday as the day for the Lord, and then the rest of the week they don't have anything to do with the Lord. So it's just better to have the mindset of esteem every day alike, really, if you think about it. Now, if you have a certain day of the week that you set aside, and that's your special day where, where you just do nothing but, you know, read the Bible and things like that, and that's your... In your mind, that's your Sabbath, then that's cool too. You know, you can't just say somebody's not right with God because of what they're doing on a certain day. But we know that God goes back to dealing with Israel because in the tribulation, the Sabbath observance comes back again. In Matthew 24, 20, it says, But pray ye that your flight be not in the winter, neither on the Sabbath day. So right now, during the church age, you don't have to keep the Sabbath. But once the church leaves, God goes back to dealing with Israel, the Sabbath comes back. Now, chapter 32, you got the golden calf. This is a wild chapter right here. Israel uh, is what... Uh, ends up making a false god this golden calf and they they worship it in this chapter Israel sins a great sin Exodus 32 1 it says and when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down out of the mount the people gathered themselves together unto Aaron and said unto him up make us gods which shall go before us. For as for this Moses, the man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we want not, we want not what has become of him. You see, your spirituality shouldn't rely on a man like theirs did with Moses. If your mentor dies or is just absent for a while, you should be able to keep going. If he died, you should be far along enough in your walk with the Lord that you can pick up his mantle and go on for God without him. The people said, we want not what has become of him. This reminds me of people today. They think the Lord isn't coming back. You see, Moses is a type of the Lord Jesus Christ. And, you know, they don't think Aaron's or they don't think Moses is coming back. They think he's just gone for good. They think the whole thing was just a, a sham or something. And that's the way people are with the Lord. Today, they just, they don't think he's coming back. They don't give him a thought. 
they're like, we don't know what's, well, what's happened to him, you know? I thought he was supposed to come back. And Second Peter 3, 3 through 4 says, Knowing this first, that there should come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lusts and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning. So Moses left for a short time and things just go south really fast. And people start saying, you know, what's become of this guy? Is this just all some joke or something? And then in Exodus 32 and verse 2, And Aaron said unto them, Break off the golden earrings, which are in the ears of your wives, of your sons, and of your daughters, and bring them unto me. It is as if Aaron didn't even skip a beat. He, he got right in on making these false gods. It wasn't, no, we can't do that. You know, he'll be back. You know, we got to worship the true God. He just, he's just like, well, give me all your golden earrings. So he was also relying on the spirituality of Moses to keep to keep going. And now he's going to make them a god out of the golden earrings. In Exodus 32, 3 through 4, it says, And all the people break off the golden earrings which were in their ears and brought them unto Aaron. And he received them at their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool. After he had made it a after he had made it a molten calf. And they said, These be thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. So what kind of God is it if you have to make it yourself? Aaron had to literally take these golden earrings, melt them. That's why it's a molten calf and used an, an, a graving tool to, to fashion it like a calf. And... That's pathetic if that's your God. If your God was made by you, what kind of God do you have? I, I've got a God that made me and made everybody else and made everything else. You see, don't you want that God, the one that made everything, not these false gods that can't see, hear, or walk. In Exodus 32, 5 through 6, And when Aaron saw it, he built an altar for it. And Aaron made proclamation and said, Tomorrow is a feast to the Lord. Notice he's calling it Lord. He's he's giving it uh, he's he's giving it the credit for bringing Israel out of Egypt. It's just all blasphemy, a very blasphemous thing. And they rose up early on the morrow. They're getting up early for it. Uh, a lot of people won't get up early for the Lord, but they'll get up early for their false god. They'll get up early to go do something that they want to do. And they rose up early on the morrow and offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings. And the people sat down to eat and to drink and rose up to play. So they had a feast and worshiped their golden calf. They were busy eating and drinking and being merry, worshiping this false god. Sounds like how it would be in the trib. Eating, drinking, marrying, giving in marriage. And then Exodus 32, 7 through 10. And the Lord said to Moses, Go, get thee down, for thy people, which thou broughtest out of the land of Egypt, have corrupted themselves. They have turned aside quickly out of the way, which I commanded them. Moses ain't even been gone that long. They're already turned. And they've made them a molten calf, and have worshipped it, and have sacrificed there unto, and said, These be thy gods, O Israel, which have brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. And the Lord said unto Moses, I have seen this people, and behold, it is a stiff-necked people. Now therefore let me alone, that my wrath may wax hot against them, and that I may consume them, and I will make of thee a great nation. So he's, uh, the Lord was, it was just going to wipe them all out and start all over with Moses and make a, a great nation out of Moses. And Moses is a picture of the Lord Jesus who... Right now, the Lord Jesus is up in the heavenly mountain of God. It's like Moses on a mount, was on a mountain down here. But one day, the Lord's coming back down in great anger. And his anger is going to wax hot and consume the inhabitants of the earth. And then he's going to set up his kingdom. So you see, it's kind of a picture of that. And in Exodus 32, 11, it says, And Moses besought the Lord his God and said, Lord, why doth thy wrath wax hot against thy people? which thou hast brought forth out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand. Moses, like Jesus Christ, intercedes for the people. 
Me and you don't need a priest in a black suit. We don't need a Catholic priest. We've got our mediator. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men. The man, Christ Jesus. Moses is a picture of him. And Jesus Christ is called the prophet like unto Moses. In Exodus 32, 12, it says, Wherefore should the Egyptians speak and say for mischief? Did he bring them out to slay them in the mountains and to consume them from the face of the earth? Turn from thy fierce wrath and repent of this evil against thy people. You see, it's funny how when God gets angry with Israel, Moses intercedes to cool him down. When Moses gets angry with Israel, God cools him down. So somebody said if both of them got mad at the same time, he would have wiped them all out. And in Exodus 32, 13, and 14, it says, Remember Abraham. Moses says, Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, thy servants, to whom thou swearest by thine own self, and saidest unto them, I will multiply your seed as the stars of heaven, and all this land that I have spoken of will I give unto your seed, and they shall inherit it forever. And the Lord repented of the all the evil. Of the, the Lord repented of the evil which he thought to do unto his people. You see, God won't go back on his covenant to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, even in Israel's disobedience. God won't go back on his covenant with the born again believer either, even in disobedience. In Exodus 32, 15, And Moses turned and went down from the mount, and the two tables of the testimony were in his hand. The tables were written on both their sides, on the one side and on the other were they written. So Moses came down with the word of God. With the, ta the tables were written on one side. It had the writing of God on one side and on the other. So when Jesus Christ comes down, what does he come down with? A sharp two-edged sword, which is the word of God. So you see the picture. In Exodus 32, 16 through 18, the tables were like the work of God, and the writing was the writing of God, graven upon the tables. And when Joshua heard the noise of the people as they shouted, he said unto Moses, There is a noise of war in the camp. And he said, It is not the voice of them that shout for mastery, neither it is the voice of them, neither is it the voice of them that cry for being overcome, but the noise of them that sing do I hear. They're down there just having a good time. When Jesus Christ comes back at the second coming, they're not going to be looking for him. They're going to be eating and drinking, partying. He's going to come in an hour that they think not. Verse 19 says, And it came to pass as soon as he came nigh to the camp that he saw the calf and the dancing. And Moses' anger waxed taut, and he cast the tables out of his hands and break them beneath the mount. And he took the calf which they had made, and burned it in the fire, and ground it to powder, and strawed it upon the water, and made the children of Israel drink of it. Just like King Jesus will take the false god, the Antichrist, at the second coming and burn him in the lake of fire, the molten calf got burned as well. Moses makes Israel drink the powdery water. That's rough. This is a rough story. He literally grounds the uh, molten calf to powder and then makes them drink the water, the, the powdery water. He used the powder of that God like some type of drink mix or some Kool-Aid packet or something and then made them drink it. Just like when Jesus Christ comes back, he's going to be making some people drink something. In Revelation 14, 10, it says, The same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with, the, with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. So just like Moses, the Lord's going to have them drinking something when he comes back. And in Exodus thirty-two twenty-six, 26, Then Moses stood in the gate of the camp and said, Who is on the Lord's side? Let him come unto me. And all the sons of Levi gathered themselves together unto him. So just like at the second coming, at the judgment of the nations in Matthew 25, he's going to separate the sheep from the goats. You're going to see who is on the Lord's side. In Exodus 32, 27, it says, And he said unto them, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Put every man his sword by his side, and go in and out from gate to gate throughout the camp, and slay every man his brother, and every man his companion, and every man his neighbor. 
You know, they got to go and slay the ones that's not for the Lord. Just like the Lord will have an army of righteous saints with him that will slay the God-haters. We're coming with them on white horses, Revelation 19, 14. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, fine linen white and clean. Now, Exodus 32, 28. And the children of Levi did according to the word of Moses, and there fell of the people that day about 3,000 men. A lot of people died that day because of their disobedience. If you live for the flesh, you'll die. Exodus 32, 31 through 33. And Moses returned to the Lord and said, Oh, this people have sinned a great sin and have made them gods of gold. Yet now, if thou wilt forgive their sin, and if not, blot out, I pray thee, out of thy book which thou hast written. And the, he said, Blot me, I pray thee, out of thy book which thou hast written. And the Lord said unto Moses, Whosoever has sinned against me, him will I blot out of my book. So Moses was like Paul in that he was willing to take the hit for the people. Paul said in Romans, in Romans 9 to 3, For I could wish that myself were a curse from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. Moses was willing to take the hit. Jesus Christ took the hit. For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Jesus took the hit. He laid down his life, took all the sin of the world on him, and died for him. Moses was a picture of the Lord Jesus. He was willing to take the hit. Paul was willing to take the hit. And that's Exodus 32 about the golden calf. We've still got about seven chapters or so left. So hopefully we'll finish this up next time.